I have miles and miles ahead of me Tales to listen to, time to spin Up ahead the road is been Wonder what's around the bend Hello, I'm Charles Kuralt. We're off again to meet a few people on the back roads of America. These are people you know, not from the front pages. They've never been on the front pages. They're people you know from next door and down the block. Their stories are some of my favorites from 25 years on the road. The age of steam has come and gone. We're gonna visit one small town where it lingers. That's Billy Bird, out for an afternoon drive in Madisonville, Kentucky. You hear that stack out there here talking to? Listen to that. You're not going to get a gas station in the like that. No rich man in his Cadillac is as happy and content as Billy Bird at the throttle of his steam engine. So that's one stop we're planning. Kind of a whistle stop. Then we'll pay a visit to Wayne McCandlish of Bremen, Ohio, builder of grandfather clocks and Ferris wheels and fanciful models of famous buildings. Wonderful things, all built one toothpick at a time. Then I thought we'd bring you up to date on the national weather. As you know, it's been a rough year for weather. We've taken a survey. Well, it was so cold last winter up here in Maine that the woods froze right in our mouths. That's right. We had to wait till spring to find out what we'd been talking about all winter. I don't think there's any place hotter than Nebraska in the summer. Uh, down here by the river, just not too far from us, it'll get so dry that the catfish will come up here to the house and get a drink at the pump. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Wandering through America, every now and then we come across a poet. I don't mean a writer of verse. I mean somebody who has inside him such a love of something. Farming, flying, furniture making, that just telling you about it, he makes you love it too. I'd say Billy Bird is a poet. Seaboard engine 6041, call an Atkinson yard off. Seaboard action, Bud, will you see if we can come out through the crossover and place them? Be okay to come out through the crossover and into the main track. All right, here we go. Billy Bird is that fabulous character from the American story, a locomotive engineer. From Madisonville, Kentucky, down through Morton's Gap to Hopkinsville and Guthrie, he has memorized every side track, hill, and curve. This is a private crossing. I'm afraid that old farm will come out there with a tractor or something, you know. Always blow for it. Billy Bird is a master at running a big LN diesel. It is well known on the railroad that nobody does it better. But some men are born too late. Billy Bird's hand is on a diesel throttle. But he left his heart back there in the cab of the steam locomotive he ran when he was young. Look for Billy Bird on his day off, and chances are you'll find him in the yard of the Crab Orchard and Egyptian Railroad over in Marion, Illinois. The CONE still runs steam, the last working freight line to do so. And here, Billy Bird, an old lover, comes to visit his old love. When they've got steam in them, they just like they're alive. There's movement about them, either the air pump's working, which sound just like they're breathing. Hear the thump, 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 thump. It sounds to me like you'd like to climb back up in the cab of a steam lo locomotive as in the old days and do it all over. Best overall job in the world. I'd rather have it and have President Reagan's job. <laughs> beautiful machine, beautiful machine. 
Now that's not a real big engine, that's a small engine. But they were main, they were mainline engines. And uh, they hauled the freight of this country. That's, they and her sisters, that's what made this country what it is today. And uh, it was a sad sight for me and other fellows like me, seeing them go to the bone yard, it broke our hearts to see them leave, to think of the good that they had done and were still capable of doing. So deep does the passion for steam engines run in Billy Bird that he went out and found one of his own. He keeps it parked beside his house in Madisonville, a marvelous Nichols and Shepard relic dating to 1919. And as the neighborhood dogs bark and the neighbors hold their ears, he regularly fires it up and drives it around town. You hear that stack out there here talking to? This matter. You're not gonna get a gas engine sound like that. It's always had a fascination for me. You can see everything. It's just the raw power and just the feel of the control of the engine in your hand, the power at your command. And uh, I just have always loved them. And ever since I've been big enough to know anything, why well, I knew I wanted to run a steam engine. So when the railroad dieselized, I had to get one that they couldn't take away from me, one that was my own. The engineers of the steam locomotives which passed Billy Bird's schoolyard in Adams, Tennessee, used to wave to him when he was a boy, and even stop and give him rides on the engine. And there began this passion for steam trains and steam men that has burned in him lifelong. He became a steam locomotive engineer just about the time they started replacing the steam engines. day, Billy Bird takes the afternoon freight down to Guthrie, all the power of a modern diesel in his hand. And he is good at it, and he does it by the book, observing the speed restrictions, blowing for the blind crossings. It is an honorable craft. But steam was poetry, and Billy Bird is a poet, born too late. This is the United Methodist Church of Bremen, Ohio, built of long lumber in 1900. This is also the United Methodist Church of Bremen, Ohio. It was built of long patience in 1978. If you look at it closely, you can see that every detail of the original church has been reproduced painstakingly in the other one. Look even closer and you can see what it's made of. It's made of toothpicks, 55,000 toothpicks. This started 20 years ago. Wayne McCandlish, seeking to pass some time away one day, picked up one toothpick and put some glue on it and reached into the box for another toothpick. I wanted something that nobody else had. Something different, I guess, because I'm different. A person would have to be different to do this. A million toothpicks have passed through Wayne McCandlish's patient hands in these 20 years. When toothpicks pass through his hands, they are forever transformed. They become clocks, or river boats, or furniture, or musical instruments. Wayne McCandlish is a builder, and the toothpick is his timber. The toothpick is his rafter, his beam, and his brace. His lumber yard comes in a little cardboard box. He draws no plans. He works from old pictures of things, trusting his eyes to take the proper measure. The neighbors who come to visit him while he toils away here in his spare bedroom began asking him questions. How many toothpicks in this? How long did it take to build that? 
so he started keeping track. The Eiffel Tower was finished after the 9,000th toothpick was put in place. The grandfather clock took 65,000 toothpicks. The Ferris wheel, 5,000. The threshing machine, 7,500. The Capitol building of the United States of America still has a wing or two to go. In this thing so far, I've got 53,000 toothpicks in it. And I started over a year ago. It may turn out to be his greatest masterpiece. Amazing, you say to Wayne McCandlish. I wouldn't know how to get started on a thing like that. Oh, that's the easy part, he says. You just take one toothpick and put a little glue on it. Well, the sun was shining a few minutes ago, but now it looks like there's a big storm coming. Mark Twain, remarking on American weather, said one time that he sat in one place and counted 136 different kinds of weather inside of 24 hours. That may have been an exaggeration. When it comes to the weather, Americans do tend to exaggerate. So when we decided to do a national weather survey, we sought out only exceptionally truthful individuals. Like my friend Roger Welch, a Nebraska tree farmer and keen observer of Nebraska weather. When the uh, real dog days come, it does get hot in Nebraska. I don't think there's any place hotter than Nebraska in the summer. Uh, down here by the river, just not too far from us, it'll get so dry that the catfish will come up here to the house and get a drink at the pump. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> well, you may laugh, but the hot weather leads to tragedy sometimes. Kendall Morse remembers what happened in Maine. Oh, it was so hot here in Maine last summer that one day in particular, the sun was so hot, it was right in the middle of corn season. That corn was almost ripe, and it got so hot but that corn started to pop, and it popped and went all over the place. And there was a herd of cows right next to that corn field. And they looked up, and they saw that popcorn coming down like that. And cows are not very bright, of course. They thought it was snow. And every one of them idiot cows stood there and froze to death. We went to Arizona in midsummer to ask Jim Griffith how he and his neighbors are holding up. It does, it does get a little bit warm. Uh, now, Joe Harris says it usually gets so hot and dry in the summertime that he's got to prime himself before he can spit. <laughs> and uh, dogs sort of wandering around at midnight trying to find some shade to lay down in. It does, it does warm up a little bit, but you get used to it. <laughs> it's been known, especially in this part of Arizona, to get so dry uh, that the trees will follow the dogs around. <laughs> Oh, it's been a dry summer. But it was sure a wet spring. Don Reed remembers how wet it got in the Middle West. In Minnesota, the floods were so bad that the turtles crawled out of their shells and used the shells as rowboats. What rain they get in the Great Plains comes all at once, eight or 10 inches in one day, and that's it for the year. Every farmer has a little lane. <laughs> out to the highway, the the and the rains and the plains fall mainly on the lanes. Uh, like this road of mine, there's some holes out here you can run set lines in and catch fish out of, <laughs> out of the road. And there's one farmer who talked about finally having to go into town, walk into town, because his wagon wouldn't get up his lane. So he had to walk into town to get some groceries, and he found this huge puddle out in the middle of his road, and there was a nice hat floating around out in the center. So he reached out with his foot, kicked in this hat, and there's a guy's head under it. So he got down on his hands, his knees, and he said, are you all right, stranger? And the guy said, well, I guess so. I'm on horseback. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever you get puddles like that, of course, you get mosquitoes. I thought we had big mosquitoes back home in North Carolina. My grandfather told me he saw a couple once the size of crows and heard them talking about him. One of those mosquitoes said, shall we eat him here or take him with us? The other one said, well, we better eat him here. If we take him with us, the big guys will take him away from us. What surprised me was to learn that they grow mosquitoes bigger than that out west. They get reasonably good sized. Uh, 
not so big that you can't shoot them down with, with a scatter gun. You know, you don't have to take a rifle to them, but uh, they get pretty good sized. But the really big ones are up in, in southern Nevada. There was one, I remember, it was in the papers at the time. There was one that come into uh, Nellis Air Force Base up there, and they filled it up with high octane fuel before they realized that it had the wrong markings on it. <laughs> that was a big mosquito. That was a good sized mosquito, yeah. That was pretty good sized. I should mention again, I'm not sure all these stories are true. Americans do lie sometimes. There was a fellow down home with such a reputation for lying that he had to have a neighbor come in to call his hogs. But if these aren't true stories, they're about as true as any other weather reports you're likely to hear. And we'll go on with ours in just a minute. In the middle of August, it's easy to forget how cold it was last winter. A friend of mine who lives in a cabin in Montana told me that it was so cold there that the flame froze on his candle, and he had to take it outside and bury it to get it dark enough to sleep. Sidney Boyum says it was cold in Wisconsin, too. It was so cold here in Madison that a night crawler came out of the ground, mugged a caterpillar, stole his fur coat, and went back into the ground. You know it's cold when you see something like that happen. In Maine, Joe Parham says it was an awful quiet winter. Well, it was so cold last winter up here in Maine that the woods froze right in our mouths. Arizonans are not much troubled by cold weather, of course, but that desert is about the windiest place I've ever been. Does the wind always uh, blow this way? Well, no, Charles. About half the time it backs around and blows the other way. <laughs> In the summertime, the west wind blows so darn hard that, that it causes the sun, the sun to set three hours later than it does in the wintertime. <laughs> I guess the, uh, the wind blows here in Nebraska sometimes, huh? All the time. Uh, they say one day the wind stopped and everybody fell down. <laughs> Ed Bell says they had a pretty good windstorm in Texas just this spring. Folks, that was a wind. That wind blew and blew and blew. It just got harder and harder. Blew the bark off the trees. Blew all the feathers off the chickens. Even blew the four tires off the old Model T Ford. Turned the bulldog wrong side out. A fellow in northern Wisconsin wrote that in 1976, they had a windstorm so bad that it stretched his telephone wires so far that when he called his neighbor across the street, he was billed $17.60 plus tax for long distance telephone charges. I was out in the front yard one day and we had a windstorm come through there. That wind was so strong it blew a big iron kettle across the front yard so fast the lightning had to strike at it five times before it got a hit. <laughs> Easterners often notice that in Nebraska, unlike other parts of the country, there aren't wind vanes on the barns. Because what you normally do is you look out and see which way the barn is leaning, and that'll tell you which way the wind's blowing. But they do have a Nebraska wind directional teller, which is a post in the ground with a logging chain on the end. And then you just watch to see which way the logging chain blows to tell which way the wind's from. And you can tell the velocity by how many links are being snapped off the end as the wind blows. <laughs> well, of course, you'd expect the wind to blow hard in Nebraska because there's nothing between there and the North Pole but a couple of barbed wire fences. And if somebody leaves one of the gates open, then there's nothing to stop the wind all the way down. Wind? Well, the wind blew so hard here last night that the hen laid the same egg four times. Laid the same egg four times. That was in Maine. This is Chuck Larkin, who lives in Georgia. I seen a chicken just this afternoon standing with her back to the wind. Laid the same egg five times. Five times in Georgia. Yeah, they, someone told me that they had a chicken here the other day that laid the same egg seven times. <laughs> seven times in Nebraska. <laughs> Old Joe was raising chickens, and first thing that happened was that he got them back the wrong way in the wind, and the old hen was laying the same egg 14 times over before she finally got it out. 14 times in Arizona. I told you Arizona was the windiest place of all, but then it's a pretty windy country, as you may have noticed. Boy, here comes the storm. Guess it's time for us to go. 
Well, time to say goodbye until our next trip together. We've heard about a story up the road here, but we kind of hope we never get there. With luck, we'll stumble upon something more interesting along the way. I can see the road is bending. Wonder what's around the bend. All these years, I've been a wonder. Just when I think I'm near the end, I always see the road is bending. And I wonder what's around the bend.